All right. We're continuing our series. We're, doing, we're taking a break from our normal style of teaching. If you've been around, and many of you have, some of you are visitors to know, we're taking a break from our normal style of teaching, which is through the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We pick a book of the Bible, and we teach through it. And so we're taking a little break from that. We're getting ready. I'm, I'm, I'm preparing for the next one. We'll be teaching through the Old Testament book of Joel starting in November. But I'm taking four Sundays to talk about something important because of what we see going on in the world around us, in the church world around us. You know, it would be nice if churches were all perfect, if they were all focused on the right things, focused on God, focused on his word, focused on growing people in the image of Jesus Christ. And now I'm guessing almost all churches would probably at least give lip service to that's why they exist. The evidence of their actions and behavior seem to indicate something else. And so one of the roles of the church, of the pastors of a church, is to give warning that there are times, there are, there are things out there in the world that we need to be watching out for. That there are churches out there that if you were to ask me my opinion of them, my response would probably be something like, don't go there. Okay? You don't really need any more than that. You, know, don't, you don't have to trust me. You can go figure it out yourself. But there are churches that are just doing things that just, I don't believe, please God. And I believe they do more to distract us away from a pure worship of God into something that is impure. And so, so that's what this series is about because, you know, we as a Calvary Chapel church, we, we, were, you know, we were trained and brought up by Pastor Chuck to, to have certain fundamental beliefs, that there was a certain way that we did ministry, a certain attitude we had you know, regarding certain topics within the ministry. And sadly, Pastor Chuck, well, sadly for us, good for him, he went to be with the Lord four years ago. But things have started to change. And we're seeing a shift in Calvary Chapel, some, not all, some, that is alarming to us. And I'm not going to get into a lot of details about it. There's a book out called Entertaining Deception. It's on ccfe.life. If you want to find out more about it, you can go find out about it. If you have specific questions, you're welcome to come talk to me about it. But I'm focusing on at least three out of the four topics are directly related to what we see going on. Last week, we talked about the Bible. The Bible, in our opinion, is the Word of God. Which part of the Bible is the Word of God? All, All of it. Pastor Chuck just, just pounded it into his pastors where to teach through the entire Bible, which starts in my Bible, starts in Genesis and goes all the way through the Old Testament, including the book of Leviticus and through, you know, <laughs> Chronicles. Anybody? I'm in Chronicles right now. I am. I, oh, come on. Those names are hard. Right? But it's God's word. Amen. Every word is precious all the way through the prophets, all the way through the different things we see there. Oh, we all love the Gospels. Everybody loves the Gospels. Oh, some of those epistles, Romans, that's a little hard. Hebrews, whoo, who can understand Hebrews? All of us can. All of us can. And Revelation, even though there's some things in Revelation that are hard, it is the word of God. And something I shared last week is that God gave us his word so that we would know him. The whole Bible is to tell us about God, specifically Jesus Christ. And if you start leaving pieces out, leaving sections out, you are leaving out an understanding and a knowledge of who God is. And I don't think that's right. And sadly... In Calvary Chapel, where you would never expect to hear this, we have people telling us, hear them saying that you ought to stay out of that section of the Bible. Pastor saying that. That's rude. That's exactly right. You know, if, 
Pastor Chuck was paying attention. Somebody said he'd be rolling over in his grave. He's not paying attention to us. He's got way bigger things to be dealing with right now. He is in the presence of Jesus Christ and loving it. But we have to deal with what we, what we're, what's going on here. And so that's what this is about. We're talking about that. We're taking it four weeks. We're going to get into another topic here today. Again, I'm not going to focus on what the, the negative things because, honestly, I'd like you just to stay here and don't worry about going anyplace else because, you know, then you're safe. Right? Amen. Except Pastor Peter and his family, you have to go somewhere else because that's what God's calling you to. But you can come here anytime you want, so just know you're always welcome. Yeah, as, as I want to talk about this topic here today, what's important. I didn't grow up in the church. Right? Anybody besides me not grow up in the church that you came to faith after you were an adult? That's the way I was. I didn't grow up in the church. Matter of fact, I had very little experience in the church before I met Kelly. Kelly dragged me to church for quite a while before I came to faith. And so there were some weird things that happened in church. You know, things I didn't grow up with. Yeah, you know, Tia's over here nodding her head. Same thing. You show up at church and, and people are doing kind of just what I thought were, was just weird stuff. Why is there a band here? Why is there a band? And why, and why are we singing? It made no sense to me. You know, I mean, we as, you know, I've been, I've been, a, I've been a believer now for 20 years. You know, and, and if you've been a believer for a long time, you forget these things. You forget what, it, what it's like to, to not be a believer. I, I know I, it starts to get a little bit more cloudy. The, the longer it is that I've been, I've been saved, the, the harder it is for me to remember back in the beginning. But people were doing stuff, and I just didn't understand it. You know, the, the, the guy up in front, he's telling us to stand up. Why? Then he's telling us to sit down. Okay, what's going on here? And then sometimes people would just randomly stand up. What is going on? Then somebody would raise their hand. I was like, are they asking a question? <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, these thoughts are growing through my mind. I'm an unbeliever. I don't understand what's going on. You know, these things, we've got to understand it. There's a reason why we do what we do in the church. And we can't just do them and forget. There are people around us that don't understand what's going on. I didn't get it. You know, people are singing. Why are we singing? You know, not everyone was singing, though. Some people would sing, others would. What's up with that? You know, I couldn't figure out if it was a Christian concert or if it was Christian karaoke. You know, words up there were all singing to these words. I didn't make any sense to me. Well, I, I've come to understand took me a while to finally get what's going on. And the longer I am in the faith, the more important I see this topic of worship being in my life. When before it was not important, it was not significant, it was not meaningful to me. Matter of fact, I, I, was, I thought it was weird. Kelly will tell you there in many ways I was annoyed by it. I didn't like it. And I would be like some people showing up after the, after the, the music's done. You know, I'll come and listen to the message. I didn't really care about him either. But I would come and listen to the message. But I didn't really care about the worship. But now I'm understanding just how important this is. How important it is for my own relationship with God. And how it does something inside of me that nothing else can do. So we're going to pray, and then we'll get into this topic of worship. Heavenly Father, I ask, Lord God, that you, would, that you would minister to our hearts about just what it means to worship you. And Lord, we're going to talk about, it's not just about the singing and the instruments and all of that stuff. There's way more to it than that. But Lord, help us to understand, Lord, that we might be able to worship you with every bit of ourselves, with our whole being, our heart our soul, and our mind. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to worship you. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Jesus, that you made a way that it is even appropriate for us to worship you and even possible. And so we thank you for this morning, and we ask for your blessing on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Our topic today is what's important about worship. Before I was saved, Kelly would take me to church, and I would go just to make her happy. I had no interest, I had no desire, and sometimes I would go as, you know, I would object to the whole process, but I would go. And I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. And I usually found it to be somewhat annoying, as I said. But I've come to understand that, that worship is a lot more than the playing of music and the singing of songs. The vision statement of our worship ministry says this. The vision of the Calvary Chapel French Valley worship and multimedia team is to create an environment in which the worship of God is visible, meaningful, and transformational. Our mission is to lead people to engage the mind, the body, and the soul in the exaltation and glorification of God in Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit in love and humility, not necessarily through music. Very nicely written that David, our worship leader, wrote that. Our typical church service follows a very consistent pattern. Been here for a long time, you know, as we follow. A very consistent pattern. We do that on purpose. Many of the things we do in church, most churches do things on purpose. But we open with a prayer, as we believe prayer is important. We're going to talk about that next week. Then come the announcements. What's the life of the church? There is a life to the church. That's important as well. Four or five worship songs. Then we take the offering. Then a message or a sermon after that. And we close with another prayer. And sometimes communion. And sometimes with another song. I'm going to focus right now on those four or five songs that we sing about why we do it, what's the purpose of them, and what your attitude, you know, probably ought to be in relation to them. We're going to be all over the Bible today, so get your Bible turning fingers busy. First Chronicles 15, First Chronicles 15. If you don't have a Bible, they're scattered all over the room. You can go ahead and grab one of those. We'll be, we'll be doing a lot of reading in the Bible. I won't be putting many of the verses up because we're going to go through a bunch of them pretty fast. First Chronicles 15. This activity that we call worship, that we typically call worship, has been important to the people of God for a long time. It, King David, we're going to be looking at a, an event in the life of King David, reigned over the people of Israel about 3,000 years ago. 3,000 years ago, King David was on the throne. And the most holy object in the whole world, in the whole world, was an object called the Ark of the Covenant. It was the most holy object in the whole world. There's some say it still exists. You know, I'm not convinced about that. It might still exist. If it still existed, it would still be the most holy object in the world. King David, as he's um, established himself... In, in his uh, kingdom, he established himself in the city of Jerusalem. And once he did, he moved, wanted to move the ark into Jerusalem to be close to where he was ruling. First Chronicles 15, pick it up in verse 14. So the priests and the Levites, the Levites were the people that helped in the, in the religious exercises, sanctify themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. Then, verse 16, David spoke to the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers accompanied by instruments of music, stringed instruments, harps, and cymbals by raising the voice with resounding joy. Okay, a few pages to your right, many pages to your right. 2 Chronicles 29. About 300 years after David, one of his descendants, um, Hezekiah, was one of his descendants, is king over Judah. A big chunk of the nation of Israel at that, at that point has turned away from God. The northern tribes have turned away from God. They are not worshiping him. And uh, they've pretty much fallen into a state of uh, apostasy. Hezekiah is ruler over the southern kingdom. And, and, and they, go, they go hot and cold with God. Hezekiah does a, 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 a restoration of the, of the religious 
exercises. He brings this reform into the nation of Israel and brings them back into a right relationship with God, a right worship of God. In 2 Chronicles 29, it talks about Hezekiah, starting in verse 25. And he, Hezekiah, stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord. That's the temple that, that, his, that David's son Solomon built with cymbals, with stringed instruments, with harps, according to the commandment of David, of Gad, the king's seer, and of Nathan, the prophet. For thus was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. Commandment. They're commanded to worship God in this way. Verse 26, the Levites stood with the instruments of David, the priests, with the trumpets, then Hezekiah commanded them to offer the burnt offering on the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord also began with the trumpets and with the instruments of David, king of Israel. So all the assembly worshipped, the, worshipped the singer sang, the trumpeter sounded, and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And when they had finished offering, the king and all who were present with him bowed and worship. Verse 30. Moreover, King Hezekiah and the leaders commanded the Levites to sing praise to the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. So they sang praises with gladness and they bowed their heads and worshiped. You to notice in verse 30 it says that they were saying the words of David and of Asaph. Who knows what the longest book in the Bible is? Somebody say it. Psalms. Psalms is the longest book in the Bible. Do you know what the, what the book of Psalms is? It's a song book. The word psalm, turn to Psalm chapter 4. Turn to Psalm 4. The word psalm means sacred song or hymn. That's what the word psalm is. So when you're reading through the psalms, understand that they are songs that were sung by the people of Israel. Still sung by the people of Israel today. Many of the psalms, are, if you go to a synagogue, and you wouldn't understand it probably because they're probably going to sing them in Hebrew, but, uh, but they still sing these same psalms that they did 3,000 years ago. Many of them include directions and instructions. For a long time, I thought these were all kind of comments put in by you know, translators and interpreters, but these are in the original language. Verse, chapter psalm, psalm 4, verse 1, slow down. I'm excited. It says here, now each of your Bibles probably says something else. It might have a title. Like in my Bible here, it has a title, The Safety of the Faithful here under Psalm 4. But under that, it says this. It says, to the chief musician with stringed instruments, a psalm of David. So he's given to the chief musician. Other translations say to the choir director or choir master. And the idea there is, this, is that this is not just one person standing up and singing or, or, or doing this. It's meant to be a group. And in this church, who's the choir? You are. You're the choir. That's why you hear me regularly. When I hear you singing, I tell you, as, a, as the pastor of the church, it fills my heart with joy when I hear you singing. I love hearing David. David's awesome, and he does a great job of leading us into worship, but I know it blesses God's heart when God's people are worshiping him in song. I know it does. Goes on to say, with stringed instruments, that's why we have a band, because all throughout the Bible we see it over and over and over again. And if you come from an environment where there's only one instrument that's allowed to be played, Okay, that's not in the Bible anywhere. You know, you can only have an organ. Okay, you'll never prove that to me in Scripture, ever, because that doesn't say it anywhere. Matter of fact, all through the Bible, every theme and variation of instrument you could possibly imagine. I heard recently somebody talking about getting an accordion and adding it to the team. Not so sure about that one yet. I'll have to wait and see. You know? We'll, do, we'll make a joyful noise to the Lord. Amen? Yeah. And throughout the book of Psalms, you also see a number of different authors. And so David and Asaph and other people um, have, have written these Psalms. And so these, these things come from all over. We move into the New Testament. One of the things we see, one of the, one of the very first things we see 
is we always want to look and see, okay, we have the Old Testament, great, that gives us an example of what, they, what, the, what the Israelites to do. What about Christians? What do Christians do? You know, Christians are not the same as Jews. There's a difference between the two of them. And the way that Jews practice their religion is different than the way Christians practice their religion. So we need to, you know, bring that into the New Testament as well. One of the things we see in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, both of them describe to us Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, after the Last Supper, he and the disciples sang a hymn right before they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And so Jesus, Jesus sang hymns uh, just as uh, his ancestors probably did, his, his biological ancestor Mary and, and others. We see later on Paul and Silas in the book of Acts when they're in the city of Philippi. They're in the city of Philippi and, and uh, they're not there on vacation and uh, they end up getting thrown into prison. And I, I don't know about you, I'm pretty sure my behavior might not be nearly as holy as theirs was because at midnight, they are singing and praying. They're singing hymns and praying. Later, Paul gives instruction in Col to the church in Colossae in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. All throughout the Bible, and we get all the way through the book of Revelation, we see singing even in the book of Revelation. Heaven is going to be rejoicing regularly, often, maybe even continuously. There may be a worship team busy throughout the, the expanses of heaven. That's what we do. Why do we do it? What is it? The word that best describes what we do here on a Sunday morning is the word praise. The word praise is defined as the offering of grateful, that's a key word, homage, which means respect or reverence, in words or song as an act of worship. Turn to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Worship, when we come together and sing, we are collectively worshiping God. In Psalm 111.1, it says, Praise the Lord, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. Worship, praise, is a matter of the heart. It, it's one of the byproducts of our relationship with God. It's one of the realities in Romans 5, 5, it says that God poured his love into us. And if I love God, there ought to be an expression of that love in some way, somehow. Somehow, the reality of my love for God ought to come out, right? Would you acknowledge that? Would you re realize that when you really love somebody, they know it, right? Somebody say, yes, yes. You know, yes, they know it. You know, Kelly knows I love her, not because I say it every day, at least once a day, many times more than that usually, but because I show her my love. And we're called to do exactly the same thing. God loves us. We know he loves us. We know How do we know he loves us? Well, he sent his son to die for us on the cross, to pay for our sins, to make a way for us to be right with him. He proved his love for us over and over and over again. Then he poured his love into us, and he wants us to respond in some way. And one of the ways that we respond to God is through praise. And we gather together, that's what we're doing. Worship is a matter of the heart. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus um, enters into a conversation with a lawyer who the sense is that they're trying to trap him. And he says one of the most powerful statements in all of the Bible in this section. You know, people, you will often say that, that faith is a private matter. You ever heard that? You, talk, you try to talk to somebody about faith, oh, so that, that, that's a private thing. You know, my, my faith, my religion, my whatever, that's private. I disagree. I disagree. Nowhere in the Bible does it even hint that my faith is a private thing. In fact, 
my conviction is that if your faith isn't public, uh, your faith is questionable. Your faith, real faith, is a very public thing. And one of the ways that I prove that I love God is by worshiping him, praising him. Matthew 22, verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Real faith shows itself in expressions of love. And one of the ways we show our, our love of God is when we gather together to praise him. Worship done right is a public expression of how I feel about God. I'm joining together with other people who love God, and we together are expressing our heart for God, how we feel about God. Worship is an offering. We talk about that. We, we offer our worship to God. It's an act of worship. It's an act of love. You know, some people question, why do you put the offering after the worship? Well, frankly, because we see them as, as similar acts. They are acts of worship. When we gather together and we sing, we are offering our praise to God, our adoration, our love to God. It's, an, it's, it's a response to what he has done for us, that God has done certain things. He saved me. He has brought me through whatever storms I've, I've experienced in my life or bringing me through storms that I'm experiencing right now, or he will bring me through the storms that are coming tomorrow. He's doing all of that, and he never leaves me. He never forsakes me. He's always there. He's always doing something in my life. And so when I'm, when I'm together and, and those words come up on the screen, I am, I am joining in, recognizing the reality of who God is, and I'm praising him. I'm offering this worship up to him as an offering of love and adoration. And then we, we pause in between that and the message and we take the offering. And the offering, I believe, is another act of worship. God has blessed me in some way. Materially, practically, physically, he has blessed me. And one of the ways I worship him is to give something back in obedience to his word, but also as an act of faith and worship and love and adoration. That's why we do it. We see them both as acts of worship. And so we put them together. God loves it when his people worship him. Amen. Loves it when we worship him. And he responds when we worship him. I don't know about you, but I've had some pretty radical experiences with God in the, in the moments of worship. When we're just, we're just, we're just joining together, there's something powerful about the people of God coming together and, and praising him. I've shared this probably before, but if you haven't heard it, you know, I, I love going to men's retreats. When we go to men's retreats, you know, most of the knucklehead men that are sitting around you, well, they may not sing at a church service. You get them away up on a mountain, they'll sing. And it's powerful. It is amazing when the men of God lift up their voices to God and worship him. Powerful, powerful. Turn to John chapter 4. It's the last place I'm going to make you turn today. John chapter 4. We have an account, and it describes to us what God is looking for in worship. It's a conversation recorded between Jesus and and a woman, a Samaritan woman, beside a well. Samaritans and Jews didn't get along because the Jews disliked the Samaritans, disapproved of them. Samaritans were a, a group of people in the land of Israel 
who had been imported, many of them had been imported from foreign nations, and they had joined together with Jews. And so there was a, a mingling of the race, and they, they considered them less than pure people. But it wasn't just because of their, of their you know, inbreeding or mixed breeding or whatever it is. A big part of it was their religion. Because not only did they bring these people from other nations, they brought their religion from these other nations as well, and they mixed it with Judaism. And so they saw their, their religion and their faith as impure. And so Jews would have, typically have nothing to do with the Samaritans. Well, Jesus didn't have a problem with that because he loves everybody. And so he's having this conversation with this woman. It's a powerful, powerful conversation that he has with her. And at some point during the conversation, the topic of worship comes up. So let's pick it up in verse 19 of John chapter 4. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. She's probably referring to Mount Gerizim, that is the north of Jerusalem. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, woman, Believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and and truth. Everything we do with in, in, in worship, and David and I spent a lot of time talking about this, and we minister to each other about this topic on, on almost a weekly basis, as regular as we can, as his schedule allows. And we talk about this because what we are desiring, what we're, what we're working toward is to raise up true worshipers. That's what we want. We want we don't, we're not looking to have a perfect worship team. Because we can't find the perfect people to put on it. We got people like JJ. We got, you know, that's what we get, you know. Love JJ. I've known JJ for about a thousand years. So love that guy. You know, it's not about having a perfect worship team. It's not about having, you know, some huge sound system, some, you know, flashing lights and fog machines and all that, all that stuff. It's not about any of that stuff. It's about creating and training up and raising up true worshipers. That's why we have so many people up here on the worship team. Not so that we can wow you with how amazing we are, because, because we're helping them to be true worshipers. David's number one goal when he comes up here is to worship God with, it, with everything that he has. Everything. Secondarily, he leads us. But his number one goal is to worship God. And that's all, every person that comes up here, their same goal is to worship God in front of you. They want you to see what worshiping God looks like. And then we are to follow. We are to join them as they worship God. We're to join them. As they're praising God, we're to join them. But God is looking for true worshipers. Well, if there are true worshipers, what does that imply? That there are what other kind of worshipers? False. False, False worshipers. And you know what? If you're here and, and you're like I was, where, you know what, the worship thing is just plain annoying or, or distracting or whatever it is, that's okay. That's okay. You keep coming. You keep hanging out with us. It's my prayer that someday worship will take a life of its own in your heart. Sadly, there are churches out in the world around us that have lost the focus. That their focus is not on being worshipers. It's not on creating true worshipers of God. It's about the show. It's about the music. It's about being perfect up there. Amen. Worship leaders who ought to be the lead worshiper are turning into rock stars, superstars. 
You know, the church has only one superstar, right? Who is it? Oh, good church. That's exactly right. Nobody takes his place. Nobody, whether it be somebody up here in front, anybody up here in front, none of us are called to step in front of Jesus. We are to represent him. We are to reflect him. We're to point him, you, us, him to you, you to him, whatever I'm trying to say. You know what I'm trying to say. They're trying, we ought to be trying to bring you in that place of absolute adoration of God, complete and total surrender to the, to the will of the Holy Spirit in, in recognition and gratitude for what Jesus did for you. That's what we're up here to do. And there are churches that have different a vision than that. They have a different purpose than that. Now, I don't know that they're doing intentionally. I hope not. I'm hoping it's just an ignorance. The worship set should never be a concert. You know, if you ever see somebody reaching and grabbing their lighter and, you know, you know, whatever in it, we know we're in trouble. I guess we don't do that anymore. I guess you take your cell phone out and do it. Now, I don't know what they're doing these days. I haven't been to a concert in a long time. I never had lighters with me in, in those days, so, you know, I don't know what I would have done if I, never mind. Never mind. As a church, we believe that this thing we call worship or praise, it, it, its purpose is to focus your heart, is to focus you on God. To prepare your heart for what God wants to say to you. We believe the praise service is designed, and, 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 and David, I know, works and prays about this, because I send him my message, and he, he creates a set based around what I'm going to be teaching. This, what they do up here is to open your heart to what God wants to say to you. That's what it's for. That when, when we do that, when we're singing, when we're praising him, when we're opening ourselves up to him in, in the act of praise, we are actually opening ourselves up to what God might want to say to us or do in us. You know, uh, unless you're perfect, do we have any perfect people here today? No, no perfect people. Now there's probably nobody um, perfect watching online right now either. There's no perfect people. God's trying to do something. He wants to do something because he loves you so much that he wants to change you to make you better, to transform you into the image of his son, to make, it, make you just amazing. And he can do that if we let him. And that's the thing, don't we? We have to let him. Because don't we resist that sometimes? Don't we resist what God wants to do in our lives? Admit it, I know you do. Bunch of sinners. God's trying to focus your heart, your mind. He's trying to focus all of you on him so that his spirit can do a work in you that can't happen any other way. We believe that these songs should prepare, prepare you to hear God speak. As you're singing, it should be doing a work inside of you, preparing you to hear. We're gonna, I'm going to invite David to come up here in a minute. And we're going to end the service with a couple of songs. It's not how we normally do it, but that's how we're going to do it today. Because. But I want to say a couple of things about what it means to be a true worshiper. Jesus said that God was seeking those who will worship him in spirit and truth. True worship is a spiritual experience. It is a spiritual experience. That where we are opening ourselves up to the Holy Spirit doing something inside of us. That's a spiritual thing. And it should be a spiritual experience. One of the things we're, we're seeing out in the world is too many people are focusing on that part. They're focusing on the spiritual element. And unfortunately, they're allowing some things in that are spiritual, but the wrong spirit. They leave out the other part of that. Spirit and truth. One of the things you'll notice if you study the songs that we sing, 
there's always, there's always a biblical background behind every last word. We're very careful. There are songs, there's some really neat songs out there, but biblically, they're questionable. Their doctrine is not right. And so you won't hear them here because they just aren't right. Either that or we have to rewrite them. We just frankly don't have time for that. So we do the ones, there's lots of them out there that are biblically sound, and so we use those ones. <clears throat> By the way, you can recommend songs to, to David if you want. He'd probably disregard everything you tell him, but you could tell him. I like such and such a song by, you know, I don't know. I was going to name somebody and I can't. True worship is a spiritual experience. But there's always something that relates to truth. And that's where it's important. When, we are, when we're going to say we're going to praise God, we're going to worship God, and it's a spiritual experience, that what gets in the way of spiritual work? Sin. Sin gets in the way. And if we're going to be a true worshiper of God, the very first thing we have to deal with in our life is sin. You cannot live in sin. You cannot walk in sin. You cannot tolerate sin and call yourself a true worshiper. A true worshiper has done business with God. They have repented of their sin. Now, now, I know, I know enough about what God says that we all have to deal with sin. My Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we all regularly need to do business with God and repent. But once we've repented, then we can become true workers. But if you haven't repented, then you can't really worship God. Then what you're doing, it, it may resemble worship, but it's not really worship. For the very first thing we have to do, we want to have that spiritual experience with God, is to repent. And we would encourage you. We would, we would ask that if you really want to experience God the way that you should, be a worshiper of God, that before you walk into this place, that you're spending some time with God. You're repenting. You know, I do that. Yeah, I do that all the time. You know, you know every, every now and then you'll see me up here sitting. I always sit up here in front. I do that for a reason. We'll talk about it later. I do that for a reason, but then I, I pray. And the very first thing I do is I say, God, I'm not really sure what to confess right here, but I repent. Make my heart right. If I'm going to hear from God, if I'm going to praise God, if I'm going to worship God the way he wants me to, he wants me clean before him. And I get clean by repenting. His word tells me, 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sins, he will forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. True worship is also based in truth. God wants us to be real when we worship him. He wants us to just let, let ourselves go and just worship him. Don't think about the people around you. Don't think about you know, what is going on in your life, just worship him. I want to close with the scripture. I've read it once already. I want to close with Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. And David, you can bring the team up now if you'd like. Matthew 22, 22 tells us to love God with our whole being. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. True worshipers of God worship him from a whole heart. They, they give all of themselves to him. And it's coming out a heart of a heart of love, love that he poured into us when we were saved. I would challenge you. Now, I don't know where you are. I don't know what background you come from. I don't know what your attitudes are toward any of this stuff. But what I'm going to say to you is if you can't join in the public worship of God, can you honestly say that you love God with your whole heart, with your whole soul, with your whole mind? Can you say you love him with every bit of yourself if you can't join in the public worship of him. Now, you can be saved and not do that, but you can't call yourself a true worshiper. Not if you can't give him your all. 
I would also challenge you, if you truly love God with your whole being, then your whole life becomes an opportunity to worship God. Now, we gather together and we sing a few songs here and we praise him publicly and together. But ultimately, every bit of our life is an opportunity to worship God. Can be an act of worship unto God. If, I'm, if he's to have my whole heart, my whole mind, and my whole soul, all of it, that's more than just one hour a week, right? An hour and a half a week. In my case, maybe sometimes two hours a week. Not going to go that long today. Does he have all of you? Do you worship God on Monday? Do you worship God when you're driving on the road? Do you worship God? Is it an act of worship when you're interacting with other people, when you're talking with them? Are the words coming out of your mouth an act of worship to God? Because they should be. They can be. The way that you're treating other people, is it an act of worship to God? Because that's what it should be. If I should worship him, if I should love him with all of myself, then everything I do can be an act of worship and should be. So I challenge you. Now, again, if you're just learning that for the very first time, I don't expect you to nail this 100%, but we can try to do a little bit better, can't we? We can try to love God a little bit more today than we did yesterday and a little bit more Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and keep at it until we nail it, right? right. The more I learn to love God, the more this verse is true to me. 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, when do you think we ought to be glorifying God? All the time. All the time. All the time. Everything we do can be an act of worship unto God. How are other people going to learn how to worship God? How are they going to desire to worship God? How are they going to get any clue about what it means to worship God if they can't see it? In you. God doesn't need our worship. You know that, right? Doesn't need it. God needs nothing. But he created us to be the object of his love. He created us to be the vessels by which his love is spread throughout the whole world. And we do it when we turn our whole life as an opportunity to praise and worship and glorify him. As David and the team leads us in a couple of songs here, I want you to focus not on anything. If you don't know the words of the songs, then focus on the words. Allow those words to just fill your heart and mind and remind yourself that God loves you and he created you to worship him. Amen? Amen. David. sing, sing, sing to my God, my King, for all else fades away, and I will love, love, love with this heart you've made, for you've been good always. Let's sing that again. I will sing. And I will sing, sing, sing to my God, my King, for all else fades away. And I will love, love, love with this heart you made, for you've been good always. I will sing. And I will sing, sing, sing to my God, my King, for all else fades away. And I will love, love, love with this heart you made, for you've been good always. 
for you've been good. For you've been good always. For you've been good always. Let's stand for one more song. Let's sing with this heart open wide. With this heart open wide. From the depths, from the heights, I will be a sacrifice. With these hands, with these hands, lift it high. Hear my song, hear my cry. I will be. Sacrifice. I will bring a sacrifice. I lay me down on my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, lay me down. No. No life apart from you Lay me down, lay me down Let's sing, letting go of my pride Letting go of my pride Giving up all my rights Take this life and live Shine, 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 take this light, Lord, let it shine. I lay me down, I lay me down, I'm not my own, I belong to you alone. Lay me down, lay me down, no. is true. There's no life apart from you. Lay me down, lay me down. No, lay me down, lay me down. There will be my joy to say. Your will, your way, it would be my joy to say. Your will, your way, it would be my joy to say. Your will, your way, always. Let's sing that again, it would be my joy, it would be my joy to say. Your will, your way, it would be my joy to say. Your will, your way, it would be my joy to say. Your will, your way, always. Sing, I lay me down. I lay me down. Lay me down, lay me down No, and on my heart this much is true There's no life apart from you Lay me down, lay me down No, lay me down, lay me down So
join me in a word of prayer as we uh, close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity, and we pray, Lord God, that this worship service that we've offered to you is pleasing to you, a pleasant aroma in your, in your nostrils, Lord God. We pray, Lord, that it would be sweet and amazing. And I pray right now, Lord, your word says that you seek true worshipers. I pray, Lord God, as we leave this place, we leave as true worshipers, devoting our heart, our lives to worshiping you with every word that we say, every thought that we think, every act that we do, that, Lord God, we would be true worshipers. That, Lord, that we would focus every bit of our lives into an act of worship. And we know, Lord, that will cause a transformation in our hearts and minds. We know if your word tells us you seek something, Lord God, we also know that you bless it when you find it. And so I pray for your church, your people, that we would be true worshipers and that we'd experience the blessing that you will bring to those who walk in your ways. We love you, Lord. I lift up everyone here and all their cares, all their worries, all their circumstances. We lift up the difficult things we see going on in the world around us. Lord, we know, Lord God, while we can't explain everything, we know, Lord God, that you're in heaven. We know that you have a plan. We know, Lord God, that there is going to be an end to these things. And that end is going to be the arrival of your son, Jesus Christ, and he is going to make it all right. And until then, Lord God, give us peace. Give us hope. Give us strength. Lord God, we know, Lord God, that you care. And so we lift up this day. We lift up all these things into your precious hands. And we thank you, Lord God, that you hear. We love you. We praise you. We lift this day up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.